saw me just moving my mouth earlier. They didn't. I, I actually have a voice now online. Welcome to all those online. Uh, hey, all of you who are our guests today, we're just so grateful that you're here. Merry Christmas. It's such an exciting time to be in church and to remember all that's going on. Today is the final Sunday in Advent, and the wait is almost over. It's almost over. Today is like the breaking of the dawn. Beams of light are beginning to break through the darkness. They tell us that light is in its fullness is almost here. Love personified is almost here. So with great excitement, we anticipate the joy of Christmas Day. Why? Because Christmas is Jesus. Christmas is Jesus. It's the whole reason for the season. So as, um, as we celebrate Christmas, let's begin and looking at the arrival, the arrival of Jesus. So if you have your, your Bibles or your smartphone, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 7. It's just so exciting to see everybody and every, those of you who brought your family with you. Everybody's just looking so handsome and dapper and just so great. Awesome. Man, I wish you'd look like this every week. No, I'm just kidding. No, 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 no. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. You look great every week. All right. All right. If you're there, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. It reads like this. This is the account of the birth of Jesus Christ. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor, that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of the region of Syria, and all went to be registered and taxed, each to his own town, his hometown. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, King David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes or strips of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Well, that's the story. That's what this, all, all this holiday, it hinges on this. All of our celebrations of Christmas rest on this event that Jesus was born in humble circumstances to live a life not for himself, but for you and me, so that he could be the one to bring reconciliation between God and humanity. And that is what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. About, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. The Son of God came into the world to rescue sinners, sinners like me, sinners like you. This is why we sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king, the king of heaven. It's an amazing thing when we think about all the birth of Jesus entails that he spanned time and eternity and the miracle of his birth, the virgin birth, and he came for us so that we could be rescued from our sin. That just makes me happy. I'm just, uh, that just makes me excited that the king of heaven, the Lord of all the earth, the creator of everything, loved me enough to come and live in this world. So I just want to take a few moments and look at this passage and get a couple of takeaways from this passage that we just read. And so let's take a few short minutes and look at the lessons from the arriving. I promise I'll only take about two hours. It'll, uh, it'll be real short. No, it, it'll, it, just, just a few minutes and we'll be out of here. And you can open those presents. But before that, I want to look at the greatest present of all time Jesus Christ. So let's look at lessons from the arriving. Lessons from the arriving. Lessons number one, if you're taking notes, and there's a note, there's places on the back of your bulletin to take some notes. 
Lesson number one is God moves heaven and earth for us. God moves heaven and earth for us. In fact, he already did. He already did. So the birth and the arrival of the Son of God was highly planned and uh, by God. It was highly planned and a uh, very nuanced event. The Christ, the rescuer, del- deliverer, had to be born in a particular place at a certain time, a particular time. Why? Why was that? Because God had told his people where to look for the Messiah so that if someone else came and said, I'm the Christ, I'm the one sent from God, but they weren't born from Bethlehem, they said, that was an easy check off. Nope, you're not him because we know where he's supposed to be born. He's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And if you weren't born in Bethlehem, sorry, Charlie, you ain't it. So God knew exactly where the Christ was supposed to be born, and he told people about it so that people could, could know that Jesus was the Christ. So now, Mary and Joseph, they get the news of the newborn king that Mary's pregnant. Now, they're living in Nazareth. Where's Nazareth? It's in the region of Galilee. It is in the northern kingdom. So in the Bible, uh, there was the original country and state of Israel, but it, it had a split. And then the northern ten tribes created a country called Israel, and the southern tribes created a country called Judah. And so the northern... In the northern kingdom is where Nazareth Nazareth is. Bethlehem is just outside of Jerusalem, not too far, just a few miles. And so how do you get the, the Savior of the world, the mother bearing Jesus, 60 miles south? How do you get how do you get her to move with step? It was somebody who's not yet her husband to move 60 miles south from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Well, God in his great power, he does something amazing. He upsets the fruit basket. He moves the whole world so that he can get Joseph and Mary from Nazareth, 60 miles south, to Bethlehem. Now, the Roman government had rule over about a quarter of the population of that time. And Jerusalem and Judea, they were under the rule of the Romans. And so the, the Romans ru- ruled from Spain to Syria, from England to Africa, that big chunk. And so God put it into the mind of Caesar Augustus to register and get a tax from the entire population of the Roman world. And so then, so then because of God is trying to move 60, 60 miles south, uh, Mary and Joseph, the whole world is upset and, and moved because God needs to move somebody into a particular spot. Friends, God upset the whole known world so that you could know Jesus was the Messiah. He turned the whole world upside down. A quarter of the population of the world had to be upset so that you could know that Jesus wasn't a farce, that Jesus just wasn't playing games, but that Jesus truly was who he said he was, sent from God, and a miracle birth in the town of Bethlehem. Friends, God still moves heaven and earth. He moves heaven and earth for you and for me. He moved heaven for us. How did he move heaven? He, he got the best heaven could provide. The king of heaven. He upset heaven so that we could have a savior who was perfect, who was pure. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And he's willing to move heaven and earth for you. Isn't that amazing? God... God loves you. Yeah, let's give the Lord a hand. Man, God loves you. Do you know how much God loves you? It's an amazing thing. Maybe your family doesn't like you or love you. Maybe people around you, you don't feel appreciated by them. But I want you to know right now today that there's a God in heaven who loves you so much that he turned the world upside down. He turned heaven upside down so that he could show you his love. Hallelujah. I've got good news today. God loves you. Awesome. 
Awesome. He moves heaven and earth for us. In fact, he already did. Quick, lesson number two, if you're taking notes. God always keeps his word even when we feel inconvenienced. God always keeps his word even when we feel inconvenienced. Have you ever had a day when you're getting ready to do something amazing, you're preparing for an amazing event, going somewhere, but everything you have to do to get ready is a huge pain. It's a huge inconvenience. You're trying to get out the door, and then something falls apart. You're trying to get ready, and then something blows up. Your refrigerator melts, or something. your, your house catches on fire, or whatever. I mean, you sh- You're trying to get ready for this event, and you know it's going to be awesome when you get there. It's going to be an amazing thing. It's going to be totally worth it. But everything leading up to that, getting ready for that, makes you question whether it's worth it. Whether you should give up and just say, man, I'll just catch Star Wars another time. You know, (laughs) man, I'll just, and everybody shakes their head. No, I haven't seen it yet, so heathens. No, just kidding. Um, Just just joking, just joking. Man, I feel some lightsabers thrown at me here. Um, But you almost give up, but you know that if you push through, that something amazing is on the other side. Sometimes following God and going after his great and precious promises can feel like this. You feel like, I don't know if I should give up or not. I don't know if I can handle one more thing. I don't know if serving God is worth it. I don't know if doing this thing is, is right. I know that there's an amazing plan for me. I know that God has a great heaven in store for me, but living this way is difficult. Good serving God is hard. But friends, uh, let me tell you, when we serve God, he makes it worth it. I'm sure that Mary and Joseph felt this way moving from Nazareth to Bethlehem when Mary is pregnant. I'm sure Joseph especially felt that this was a daunting task for uh, moving, packing with a pregnant wife. You know, I'm sure Mary said, did you get everything? Did you forget anything? And, and uh, Joseph's like, yeah, I, I got everything. I got, I got food for the camel. I got, you know, I got everything that we need. And she's like, are you sure? Are you sure you got everything? He's like, yeah. You know, do you know the reason why Jesus was wrapped in swaddling cloths? It's because Joseph forgot the baby blanket. <laughs> not really, not really, No. But even when we feel inconvenienced in our hurried, rushed, chaos lives, God still keeps his word. He still keeps his promises to us. When we, when we feel like nothing's going right, friends, I want you to know that God is true. That God is right and he will help you and he will be with you. The Bible says that he will never leave us nor will he forsake us. When your friends forsake you, when your family rejects you, there is a God in heaven who loves us, who stays with us, who is by our side. Next lesson, if you're taking notes, is God's timing is perfect. God's timing is perfect. I wonder if Joseph was like, really, God, now I got to (laughs) move? Couldn't you have done this a few months earlier? Like, i got to move now with a pregnant wife? Uh, I don't know if you've ever questioned God's timing, but uh, God's timing is perfect. You know, I'm sure (laughs) Joseph's like, I've got to get a pregnant lady on a donkey, go 60 miles south. Every time the donkey moves, she's got to go to the bathroom again. You know, (laughs) just questioning, really, God, (laughs) this is your timing? Really? But friends, God's timing is perfect. God's timing is right on time. This is how we know God's timing was perfect. They were right on time for the star to appear over top of them. If they weren't late, they weren't early, 
God was right on time for them, and the heavens and the cosmos and all the timing that that had to happen, the star appeared over the top of Jesus. And they got there in time for the baby to born to be born in Bethlehem. Jesus wasn't born on the side of the road. He was born in Bethlehem. God's timing is perfect. Now, maybe in your own life, you're thinking things were just fine the way they were. Uh, I was, or I wasn't ready for change. Or why now? But friends, God knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's good for you and what's not good for you. His timing is perfect. And friends, we can trust him. Now, there's always some outside influences that try to change God's timing, uh, our own choices, other people's choices. But let me tell you, our God is so powerful. When we try to mess it up or somebody else tries to mess it up, he still can make his plan happen in our lives. I just want to tell you again, friends, we can trust God. We can trust him. Last lesson, if you're taking notes, I told you I'd be quick. Last, lessons, if you, last lesson, if you're taking notes, is God is here and he is with us. God is here and he is with us. Friends, it is an amazing thing to think of that we have a God that cre- can create anything that he wants. Anything that he wants at any time. He is holy, that means he's pure, that nothing can, that impure can touch him. He's not a liar, there's nothing false in God. There's no, he's spectacular, magnificent, powerful, and yet this spectacular, powerful God wants to be with us. He wasn't content just to have us far away on the back side of the universe But he, in his great love, spanned time and eternity and was with us. He is here. Friends, Jesus wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't wasn't away from the people. He wasn't born behind a wall surrounded by guards, armed guards. He was born in a stable. He humbled himself. And he was born in a stable. He was accessible to anybody who was looking for him. Anybody who recognized the signs of his coming, anybody who recognized who he was could come and worship, could come and have access to him. The same is true today. For those who are looking for the Savior, he's accessible. For those who are looking for Jesus, he's here. He's available to anybody who would call out to him and say, Lord, I need you. Friends, the whole reason, the whole purpose why Jesus came is because we were sinners separated from God with no way of getting that relationship restored on our own. So Jesus came, lived a sinless life, the life that we can't live. Then he died in our place. On the third day, he rose again showing that he was had power over sin and death, and that he was the Son of God. And that event provides for us salvation. What do we have to do? It says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if we confess the Lord Jesus with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Super simple. And then he just radically transforms our life. If we trust him. In a moment, we're going to sing this classic, classic carol, Silent Night. But before we do, I wonder if there's anybody here that you need Jesus to come into your night and light it as day. That you need Jesus to be the light, not just of the world, but your world. I want to give opportunity, if we could just bow our heads just for a moment. You're here this morning, and you have not made a decision to follow Christ. Maybe you did at one time, but you're not following Jesus. But you would like to take this time, this Christmas Eve service, and say, I want to follow Jesus. I realize that I need him, and I want him. I want him to forgive me of my sins. If that's you, nobody's looking around, because you just raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me. 
I see your hand. I see your hand. You can put it down. I see your hands. All over. You can put it down. I see your hand. I see your hand. You can put it down. I see your hand. You can put it down. I see your hand. Can we all pray together? Repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I realize that I'm a sinner and that I need your help. That I cannot make it to heaven on my own. I need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus. Forgive me of my sin. Help me to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.